Namaste. So we've been dipping in the ocean of emptiness <laughs> just a little bit. Huh? Although it's only a dip, it seems like the deep end of the pool, right? Well, now we're going to stop messing around in the pool and we're actually going to go out in the ocean. So, uh, you know, this is taking a deep dive into the source material, the Buddha's suttas on emptiness. So I remember one time I went out in a boat with some friends beyond the island of Guam, beyond the uh, coral reef, out into the ocean and there's a there's a shelf the Marianas shelf then that drops off into the Marianas trench which is the deepest part of the ocean in the whole world 30, 36,000 feet or something like that and basically it's just like a cliff you know <laughs> goes straight down so I remember diving off the boat and going down the, the cliff wall and, you know, we were looking for shellfish and whatever. And feeling the immensity of the Marianas Deep. I mean, it was just such an awesome feeling. I think it had a lot to do with the sound. You know, just like you can hear if somebody puts a lot of reverb or something, you know. It sounds like a big space. Well, this was the biggest space I ever heard. Just awesome. And I looked up and there was a whole school of barracuda swimming <laughs> over my head. <laughs> I think I want to see some daylight here. <laughs> so anyway, for those of you who are allergic to emptiness, you should tune out right now. <laughs> this is going to get really deep. And there are lots of barracuda. <laughs> but for those who have an appetite, who have a taste, then this is going to be wonderful because we're going to go through the whole sutta. And even though it's called the, the shorter sutta on emptiness, it's actually quite long. And it goes step by step by degree to introduce you to the concept of emptiness the apophatic teaching huh? instead of the positivist teaching of being in the Vedas it's going to be the apophatic teaching of emptiness so here we go check your tanks huh? check your regulator <laughs> blow all the water out of the breathing tube and let's jump in I have heard that on one occasion the Blessed One was staying near Savati in the eastern monastery, the palace of Nigara's mother. Then Venerable Ananda, emerging from his seclusion in the evening, went to the Blessed One, and on arrival, having bowed down to him, sat on one side. As he was sitting there, he said to the Blessed One, on one occasion, when the Blessed One was staying among the Sakyans in a Sakyan town named Nagaraka, there, face to face with the Blessed One, I heard this. Face to face, I learned this. I now remain fully in a dwelling of emptiness. Did I hear that correctly? Learn it correctly? Attend it correctly? Remember it correctly? So Venerable Ananda is asking the Buddha to confirm what he heard. Did I, did I really get that right? <laughs> Why? Because it's such a profound statement. It's such a deep and important statement. 
But the Buddha is not living in this body. He's not even living in this world. He lives in a dwelling of emptiness. Now, some people try to contextualize or recontextualize this and say, well, he really means the meditative state or the meditative practice of emptiness. Uh, I don't really buy it, especially looking at the original Pali. He says, I live in a dwelling in a house of emptiness. He says, right there, plain as could be. So uh, I don't want to recontextualize the Buddha. I don't want to second guess what he's saying. He lives in emptiness. How could he, after attaining enlightenment, teach for 50 years, walking here and there, huh, everywhere, all over northern India, and teaching thousands of disciples and converting thousands of people to his views without being fully enlightened, number one, and without ever leaving that state of enlightenment. For that was his power. Well, we have a contemporary example in Ramana Maharshi. Even though he attained spontaneously at an early age, he never really left that attainment. He never really came out into the world. He always spoke from that dwelling of emptiness. And so the Buddha is the same way. And now Ananda is trying to verify this, to confirm it. So the Buddha replies, Yes, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned it correctly, attended to it correctly, remembered it correctly. Now, as well as before, I remain fully in a dwelling of emptiness. Just as this palace of Megara's mother is empty of elephants, cattle, and mares, empty of gold and silver, empty of assemblies of women and men, and there is only this non-emptiness, the singleness based on the Sangha of monks. Even so, Ananda, a monk, not attending to the perception mental note of village, not attending to the perception of human being, attends to the singleness based on the perception of wilderness. His mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction, settles and indulges in its perception of wilderness. <laughs> I have to laugh because only a month or so ago, I was in the wilderness. I was in a huge middle of a huge forest reserve in Sri Lanka. It's a different world. And in that world, it's very easy to remain in emptiness. Now, it's not difficult at all, because as the Buddha says, it's empty of elephants, it's empty of assemblies of people and horses and cattle and this and that. So that emptiness leaves a certain space. And you can feel that space, just like I felt the space of the Marianas deep. That is emptiness. The lack of thingness. The lack of becoming. One of the important differences between emptiness and nothingness is that in nothingness, you can still have becoming. No thingness can turn into thingness very easily. But emptiness, no, it can. Because emptiness has no scope for change. It's uncreated, it's unborn. See, it has no past and future. It only exists in the present because there's no change. Emptiness is always emptiness. So emptiness, to dwell in emptiness, means to stop all change, to settle, 
to relax into a no-thingness, non-objective consciousness, or unconditioned awareness. Awareness of awareness. That is enlightenment. So the Buddha, although he may walk here and there and meet with so many people and speak and so on, his awareness of his awareness never changes. That is emptiness. Oh, one more thing. That notice he says, the mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction in this awareness of wilderness, of emptiness. So it's not this, emptiness is not this terrible, scary thing that people mock it up to be. It's actually beautiful. It's actually wonderful and very pleasurable. So let's continue. He discerns that whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of village are not present. Whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of human being are not present. There is only this modicum of disturbance, the singleness based on the perception of wilderness. He discerns that this mode of perception is empty of the perception of village. This mode of perception is empty of the perception of human being. There is only this non-emptiness, the singleness based on the perception of wilderness. Thus, he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. Whatever remains, he discerns as present. There is this. And so this, his entry into emptiness, accords with actuality, is undistorted in meaning and pure. So it's not too difficult to understand how it conforms to actuality. But what does it mean? It's undistorted in meaning. Because the monk in the wilderness is not projecting, I am in a village, and all the busyness huh, and stuff and nonsense that goes on in a village. Children running around, women talking nonsense, you know, men working on material stuff, you know. All that's gone. There's only the perception of wilderness, emptiness of all of that. So he's not projecting even being a human being. One time, just after his enlightenment, the Buddha was walking and a Brahmin came up to him, attracted by his aura, his energy. And he said, what are you? Are you a deva, a god? The Buddha said, no, I'm not a deva. Are you a Gandharva? A heavenly angel? Buddha said, no, I'm not, in, I'm not a Gandharva. No. Are you a, a Rakshasa? A demon of magical powers? <laughs> Buddha said, no, no, I'm not a Rakshasa. <laughs> well then, are you a human being? Buddha said, no. I'm not a human being. So finally, the Brahmin, who was out of ideas, he said, well, then what are you? The Buddha said, I am awakened. What is he awakened to? Emptiness. Nibbana. Remember, emptiness does, is not equal to Nibbana. Emptiness is the state just before attaining Nibbana. Why is that? Because Nibbana is characterized as Sabha-Sankara Samato, the, the stilling of all Sankara. No more attempts 
to be or become anything. No more determinations to be somewhere or go somewhere or change this or that or own something or even perceive something. All those desires are let go. Does that mean that you're like stuck in the nothingness, in nowhere? <laughs> no, no. You can still come out and walk around and do stuff and talk to people or whatever you want, but you're not attached to it. You don't own it anymore. You don't desire it anymore. It's just like, oh, whatever happens, cool. And, and, and it's not that you are uh, nihilistic. Oh, this world is terrible and awful and I, I don't want to be here. And no, 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 no. That's just another form of whining about not getting what you want. No, the Buddha is past all of that. He is always in a dwelling of emptiness. That is the supreme position. That's why he's called the Blessed One, Bhagavan. And anyone who attains that space is also Bhagavan because he has attained the highest that is possible for any being. And that is Nibbana. Aum Tatsat, Buddha Saranai.